I shall be sending a text to Andrew Neil, <laughs> telling him that you did 10 beautiful minutes on my career and achievements. You really big me up in a marvelous way. So thank you very much indeed, Gareth. Uh, Ladies, gentlemen, oh, Mr. President, in fact, Mr. President, lady, and, and the new chairman, four new chairmen today. Mr. President, four new chairmen, ladies, gentlemen, fellow admirers of DW144. <laughs> Yay! I've actually been given my own copy, it's very exciting. I've been collecting your works now for many years. <laughs> And it's a little bit depressing for me what's happened recently. Of course, I had them all lined up on my shelves in previous years. Lovely red covers you could recognize. Now we've got this rather pasty white and blue stuff, but I'm coping. I'm coping. Anyway, I'm very happy. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here at this major international gathering. I've been chatting with Eli, who is uh, over here from the amusingly named Smackna. Um, which is quite exciting. It sounds like some sort of German sex club, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we take you down to Smackner later. Yeah, you have some fun there. Hey. But anyway, I I'm pleased to be at an international gathering because I'm something of an international personality myself. Uh, Eli may not realize this, but I am, inter I am international. I am Anglo-Welsh. <laughs> I'm proud to be Anglo-Welsh. My forefathers were all Anglo-Welsh. My grandparents were Anglo-Welsh. My parents, in fact, were Anglo-Welsh. Indeed, my parents burnt down their own cottage. <laughs> and I'm particularly pleased to be at such a friendly and welcoming gathering as this, because as some of you may know, normally I work for the BBC, so that most of my friends have been arrested. <laughs> I'm actually tagged myself, but that is entirely for domestic reasons. Uh, and if you're sitting there wondering why I am here today, if you are wondering why I am here today on this, well, it began as rather a balmy day, this balmy Thursday in late May, if you are wondering why I, of all people, am here today, if you're wondering why I'm here today, then already we have something in common. <laughs> I suppose I'm here because I was invited. I, I do want you to know that the, the President and the Council of uh, BNDS, I do want you to know the President and Council, if they do nothing else, that's the end of that sentence. <laughs> that's not entirely fair. They do plan ahead. And the invitation for me to come and say a few words at this gala gathering was extended some months ago. I had gone away to um, Helmand Province or to get away from it all, and uh, went there for a couple of months in order to finish my novel, because I'm quite a slow reader. And um, <laughs> there I was in the tent that I happened to be sharing with Jim Davison and Catherine Jenkins, and the mobile phone began to pulse. I picked it up, blew off the sand. And after I got through all the business of would you accept a transfer charge call from Dundee, I found I was talking to none other than your remarkable president, the great Bruce um, uh, Bissett on my left here. The toast is, have you, I, I hope you've seen him, I hope you know him. He's been our president since July, or last July, he's got until this July to go, a remarkable man. You probably haven't understood very much that he said during his presidency. <laughs> uh, and the joy is that he's president this year because probably next year he wouldn't be eligible. <laughs> This is a national organization of a major power, but obviously we probably will arrange associate membership for small offshore countries in due course, <laughs> if that's the way you choose it to be. Now, Bruce called me um, from uh, Galloway, uh, that's, that's the name of the company, and he said, is that gal, I'm, I'm going to translate it into English so you get my drift. Um, is that Giles Brudrath? I said, give or take a vowel or two, yes. <laughs> Uh, he said, my name's Bruce, Bruce Bissett, um, Galloway, you know, founded 1872, he told me all about the company. And then he said, would you care to come and say a few words at our annual lunch? I said, I'd love to, what do you want to talk about? He said, what do you talk about? I said, I give a whole range of absolutely fascinating speeches. He said, well, would you suggest one? I said, I do a very intriguing talk on prison reform. <laughs> 
You're quite right, he felt it might be the bit too near the knuckle for one or two of you. <laughs> and then he told me where this event was taking place. He said, we're doing this in Trinity House. Have you ever been? And I said, yes, actually I have. I've been here a number of times. And the first time I came to this wonderful, fascinating, historic building was literally 40 years ago this month, May 1974. And I came here because it was in this room that a man called Lord Longford, the Earl of Longford, launched an extraordinary committee. Now, Eli, you won't know who this man is. Lord Longford died a few years ago, well into his 70s. He'd been a politician in this country. He was a member of Clement Attlee's government after the Second World War, later a member of Harold Wilson's government. But he's best known as a social reformer, prison reformer, prison visitor, a bit eccentric, and as I say, died a few years ago, well into his 90s. In fact, he was a lovely, saintly, forgiving man, prison reformer, prison visitor, a bit of a frost at parties, chiefly because he liked to bring Mara Hindley with him. <laughs> But other than that, you couldn't say anything against this good and saintly soul. And 40 years ago, in this room, Lord Longford launched again, on an unsuspecting world a crusade against the scourge of pornography in our society. And he formed a committee to help him in this endeavour. And uh, I became, just down from Oxford, the youngest member of Lord Longford's pornography committee. I just want you to know the calibre of person that Bruce felt would be appropriate. <laughs> to say a few words here this afternoon. I genuinely was a member of this pornography committee. I still have the raincoat I bought at the time. <laughs> My wife has sewn up the pockets, but it's down there in the cloakroom. Uh, and we had our first gathering in this room. I think uh, Lord Longford must have had some association with Trinity House. Anyway, he arranged for the meeting to be here. And it wasn't just me and Lord Longford on this committee. That would have been a bit kinky. Uh, <laughs> as well as Lord Longford and myself on the committee, there was a bishop an archbishop, uh, a rabbi, and of course Cliff Richard. <laughs> and after the inaugural luncheon, at about this time in the afternoon, Lord Longford got up, said a few words, and then from under the table he produced two carrier bags, one Sainsbury's bag, one Tesco's bag. And from these bags he emptied onto the table a mountain of pornographic material, the most revolting magazines you can possibly imagine. And ladies and gentlemen, we were obliged, after luncheon, the bishop, the archbishop, the rabbi, myself, Cliff Richard, Lord Longford, we were obliged to sit at a, in a solemn circle at one of these tables, flicking through these disgusting magazines. We must have been sat here three hours, three and a half hours. <laughs> Truly appalling. But I'd like you, if you would, to visualize me 40 years ago, just down from university, in this very room, seated in a solemn circle, after lunch, with a bishop, an archbishop, a rabbi, myself, Cliff Richard, Lord Longford, flicking through these disgusting magazines. Oh no, oh no, oh really, oh no. Oh, oh look, rabbi, one of yours, I think. <laughs> I don't think that is the reason I'm here. I think probably I'm here is because I, I used to be a member of Parliament uh, and I think I was actually a junior minister at the Department of the Environment when the Department of the Environment has something to do with housing and housing regulations and it may have been thought that I know something about what you do. I know nothing about what you do. Uh, and I knew even less though when I was the minister responsible for what you do. I have picked up a little since then. Um, and I'm no longer a member of Parliament. I do want to make that emphatically clear. Uh, this is a respectable occasion. Um, I'm not, though, actually, when I was a member of Parliament, I was a respectable member of Parliament. I dug my own moat. <laughs> uh, my darling wife, she paid for all her own DVDs. Uh, I was a member of Parliament until the people spoke. The bastards. <laughs> In my case, they spoke in no uncertain terms, you know? I mean, I knew when the election was coming up that I knew I had contempt for my constituents. But it came as a bit of a shock to the system to find the feeling was entirely mutual. <laughs> I mean, I lost big time. My wife, she actually put our house in the constituency up for sale during the election campaign. I said, darling, this isn't sending out quite the right signal. She said, the signal is irrelevant. Giles, these people do not like you. They really do not like you. And she was right. I lost big time. There is no vapid optimism with my wife. As my wife says to me, Giles, with you, when one door closes, it's shut. <laughs> and I'd been a loyal member of Parliament. When I um, 
when John Major, I mean, instinctively, I am a loyal person. When John Major became the leader of my party, to show my loyalty, that's when I began to go grey. Uh, a few years later, now again, to show my loyalty, when William Hague became the leader of my party, that's when I began to go bald. I was only grateful that Anne Widdicombe did not succeed in her ambitions. <laughs> Who knows what might have happened. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, no, four years ago now, with the advent of the coalition, when those two beautiful posh boys got it together, Nick and Dave, you know, both over six foot tall, rather elegant, well into their forties now, looking younger, lovely glossy hair, when they came into the Rose Garden at number 10 and announced the coalition as though it were a civil partnership ceremony, I knew that gay marriage was on the agenda. <laughs> And it was just, I mean, if you, if you can cast your mind back four years ago, if you can picture those two posh boys coming down the stairs together, sashing down the stairs together, not actually holding hands, but pinkies definitely touching, you know, and they came up to the podium together in their slightly better than MS suits and they're mirroring one another body language and their matching ties and they made their vows before an expectant nation. Anyway, I watched it on live television with the sound turned down and my Judy Garland CDs playing in the background. <laughs> And that was the moment I thought, oh dear, I'm going to have to come out as a little bit gay. That is the way the world is going, and it is almost compulsory now on the Conservative front bench. I can tell you, the con well, the Conservative Party is certainly no longer the party with its back against the wall. <laughs> but I'm not sorry, in many ways, no longer to be a Member of Parliament. Because, to be serious for a second, uh, when I was a Member of Parliament, uh, well, it was different. And I think it has changed. The fulcrum of debate is no longer the Chamber of the House of Commons. When I first became an MP, there were three names. They went up on the board. You saw the names of three men. When they were speaking, you went into the chamber to listen to them. And they were the names of three guys who became MPs in the same year, 1950. Tony Benn, Ted Heath, Enoch Powell. Very different men, very different opinions. But when they got up to speak, you listened to them with respect because they spoke with authority, with conviction, from heart, using head, never, ever, ever with material handed down to them by young men in red braces. They simply spoke from their experience and were listened to because you knew they spoke with integrity whether you agreed or not. That doesn't happen rarely now. It happens not at all. The fulcrum of debate has moved from the Chamber of the House of Commons to the television studio with Andrew Neil, to the radio uh, studio, to the newspaper column. It's no longer happening in the Chamber of the House of Commons. As a backbench MP, what you say in the chamber goes virtually unreported and unrecognised. Turn on the television any time of day or night, there's nobody in the chamber except for the weekly knockabout of Prime Minister's questions. And the other key role of the Member of Parliament, of course, as well as calling the government to account in the chamber, which is ignored, is in committee, where you're there to scrutinise the legislation. And the legislation is now so complex and there's so much of it that it is impossible to scrutinise. Uh, Gareth mentioned that I'd been a Lord Commissioner of the Treasury. This means that for four years I served on the Finance Bill Committee. This is the committee that goes through the budget, year in, year out. And the last budget I, committee I sat on, the paperwork, I mean, you know, you may think DW144 is complex, and it is, and it's quite full. It is as nothing compared with the budget, which is about a document literally about eight times that thick, this much bump to go through each year in the finance bill. And out of curiosity, the last year I was doing this, I went down to the library of the House of Commons, and I asked the librarian if she could find for me the finance bill of the year in which Winston Churchill, a portrait of whom hangs in this very room, in the year in which Winston Churchill was last Chancellor of the Exchequer. And uh, the librarian went away and produced the finance bill for that year. Four pages of full scap. Now can it be that the British Empire at its height, its finances could be managed with four pages of full scap annually when each and every year now the British Parliament requires this much bump to see through its legislation and on top of that much much more of that coming from the European Union all the time. Of course not. But it makes the job of the Member of Parliament very difficult indeed because you really cannot scrutinise that. You need outside organisations, indeed ones like the B&ES, to actually help you understand the legislation that you are passing and most people pass legislation that they haven't read and certainly don't understand. And if you are the person doing it, eventually it becomes depressing and I was glad to give it up but what I was able to do before giving up being an MP was to join the government and government is the thing 
government is the excitement. That's why the Liberal Democrats want to stay in government. Nick and all the cleggy people, they're going to stay in there if they can. Vince and the cable car lads, they want to be in there because government is where the action is. Government is what it's all about. And interestingly, an organization, an association like this, no longer talks to members of parliament. Forty years ago, at an event like this, there would have been individual MPs, probably, scattered around the room, who would, you would use your MP to make your point. Now, the expectation is that Gareth and Rod and the team in Bayswater, or wherever they happen to be, they go directly to government. They expect to be dealing directly with government, which is very... Do you hear the storm outside? Farage is doing better than we thought. <laughs> Clap of thunder. It's interesting, though, that it is frustrating for people to be a backbench MP because they're not used. It's the government of the day that is in command. And I eventually joined the government. It was very exciting for me. I ended up in the Treasury. And I want to mention that for two reasons. One, that I, I, I'm going to be honored to help give out these um, awards a little bit later. And the people receiving the awards may well wonder why they're shaking my hand. Let me tell you why. Because I eventually ended up as a Treasury Junior Minister, uh, Lord Commissioner of the Treasury, Treasury Whip, and this is the person who signs the government checks. Every check is signed by, every big check, every big amount of money spent by the government is signed by a minister. And the Lord Commissioner of the Treasury signs the, the big checks. The last check I signed was for £136 billion. Pounds. <laughs> Serious money in those days. <laughs> now, I appreciate it would hardly get the Royal Bank of Scotland through a difficult morning. <laughs> but in my time, it represented big bucks. And they said to me, with these huge checks, of course, the billion pound checks, you can't be signing them alone. There will need to be a co-signatory. I said, who will that be? They said, it'll be the head of the Treasury. I assumed by that they meant the Prime Minister, because it says in the door of number 10, First Lord of the Treasury. They said, no, the Prime Minister is indeed the First Lord of the Treasury Board. The Second Lord of the Treasury is the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Then we come down to attendant minnows like yourself, Lord Commissioner. But it's HM Treasury. You will sign these huge checks with HM, with the Queen. So I went down the mile with the government checkbook to sign these huge checks with the Queen. And the first time I did this, I wasn't sure what the etiquette was, which of the two of us, you know, should sign the check first. Didn't want to patronize the Queen just because she's a woman. <laughs> or indeed pull rank, because I was the, uh, the elected one. But anyway, uh, <laughs> on that first occasion, she was holding the pen. She seemed to think she should sign first, so I let her. But, but on the last occasion, when we signed this huge check for £136 billion, pounds, Social Security payments first quarter. <laughs> After we had both signed this huge check, I said to the Queen, you know, Your Majesty, the way the government insists on the two of us signing these huge checks. I can't help wondering, Your Majesty, which of the two of us it is the government doesn't entirely trust. <laughs> she had no answer for that. She, she is a good woman and a wise woman. And you will recall 2008, the year it all began to go wrong, all the banking crisis, not that long ago now. The Queen just after then, I think it was about 2009, the Queen went to the Bank of England, not far from here. And I was then writing a book about the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh and was given privileged access to walk with her and talk with her as she went about her official duties. And uh, I was with her in attendance when they left the Bank of England, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. The Duke of Edinburgh got into the car first and the Queen was just saying goodbye to the Governor of the Bank of England. And the Queen said to the Governor of the Bank of England, oh, Mr. Governor, she called him Mr. Governor, upstairs you told me how many people actually work here in the Bank of England at the headquarters. And I'd forgotten how many people are working here. And the Governor of the Bank of England said to the Queen, oh, Your Majesty, there are 1,322 people working here. And the Queen said, oh, 1,322 of you. And not one of you saw the crisis coming. <laughs> and got into the car, at which point I saw the Duke of Edinburgh looking up at the Queen and going, mm. <laughs> He's a good man, the Duke of Edinburgh. There's also a portrait of him gazing down upon us now. He's the man who said, if ever you see a man opening the car door for his wife, it's either a new car or a new wife. <laughs> What I really want you to know is that I am here to propose a toast to you. And I want to propose a toast to you because I have decided that you know something. And I realize that I know nothing. It became clear to me that I know nothing when I was at the Treasury. 
True story, 20 years ago, you may remember, we were forced out of the ERM, the exchange rate mechanism. And I was in the Treasury at the, on that day. I went in in the morning with David Cameron, who was then an office junior at the Treasury, as was I. And we went into the Treasury that morning, not knowing what was going to happen. All the crisis began to happen. We didn't know quite what was happening. The Permanent Secretary had a book that he opened. And this told us what to do in the event of this emergency. Put the interest rates up. So we turned on the computer, and the interest rates began to go up. The interest rates were then in the gift of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And up they went a bit and a bit further, and a bit further. You may remember, we got them up to about 16% that day, even 16 and a half, but nothing seemed to be happening on the computer screen to the markets. The permanent secretary began banging the top of the computer, <laughs> thinking maybe it was the computer, but it seemed to be that our system wasn't working quite as planned. And um, eventually, as you will recall, having taken the interest rates up, we brought them down, and then we exited from the ERM. When we went in in the morning, we didn't know what was going to happen. While it was happening, we didn't know what was happening. When it was over, we didn't know what had hit us. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, nobody knows anything. So I say, thank goodness for DW144. You know what you're doing. Your book works. It was only when I left the Treasury and discovered the joys of SFG20 that I realized in this world there were some people who knew what they were doing. The politicians have no idea, ladies and gentlemen. I don't think you realize this. They have absolutely no... They mean well. They certainly mean well. But they really don't know. You know, you may have... I mean, I, I, I'm a great one for our regulation. We love B and ES, but uh, when things get desperate, we will turn to a smackner for advice as well. Um, and, but, you know, I can tell you, there's nobody at any department in Whitehall who knows the difference between smackner industrial and smackner regular. So if we put a bit of tin on that's too thick or too thin, nobody will be any of the wiser in Whitehall. So just get away with what you can. Um, <laughs> But what I'm trying to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, is can I just say, I think you're wonderful. I don't think you probably realize how wonderful you are. You actually are doing something where you know what you're doing. It matters to you what you do, and you want to do it well. And I come from a world where we just bumble around hoping for the best and have no idea at all what we're doing, um, but don't really like to admit it. So I really salute you. And I'm so pleased at this extraordinary gathering. It's a lovely room to be in. I think it's an amusing room to be in. A clever choice, if I may say so, Rod Gareth and the team to come to this room year in, year out, because clearly the ventilation doesn't work as well as it should. <laughs> and some people think that they can shortcut when it comes to cleaning ventilation. It's not good enough just to install the system. You've got to service it on a regular basis. Clearly they don't. And how brilliant of them to advertise the fact by bringing all these experts into a room where, frankly, most of us are going to faint within the next half hour. <laughs> it's a brilliant scheme. So what I love about this wonderful organization is clearly you are as modern as tomorrow. You're producing the new standards, you're setting the new standards, but you've got a lot of time for yesterday. This particular association has been going for 110 years. I mean, I loved you when you were the Heating and Ventilation Contract Contractors Association. We then knew what you did, but you've got this new name, um, and you've got to live with it now. People will think you're a building society, but what does it matter? Um, <laughs> I know. I mean, I, I wouldn't have changed it. I wouldn't. I mean, I thought heating and ventilation says what it does. Contractors, of course, they provide services as well. But no, the duct people wanted their moment. Okay, and so we compromise with this B and E S. I mean, what is it? Anyway, it's a name, and it's fine. And we've, we're going to live with it now. Let's go ahead. Let's let's try and cope with the change. I don't find change very easy. As a person, I'm a little bit anti-change. I have to tell you, the 21st century it does not suit me. I do not wish to learn another frigging password. <laughs> but the point I want to make is this. This organization is as modern as tomorrow, but it does have a lot of time for yesterday. And I like that. You have values, you have integrity, you have the tradition. But actually you realize that to make it work, you've got to be international, and you've got to be at the cutting edge when it comes to standards. You have got to actually be in the forefront of making the world environmentally a better place to live in and to work in. And you are doing that. And you've got to carry on regardless, whatever the politics politicians are doing, whatever the regulations
nations are saying you've just got to do it your way because your way is best and you know what you're doing and how right you are to propose a toast to the Queen because she is your role model because you've been through rough times in your 110 years as the Queen has through her 88 years uh, and it is not easy being Queen Queen's been Queen since 1952 that's my wife telling me to um, uh, she, I gave her Gaddis number she called you to say you're not going to tell that story about the Queen again are you <laughs> because she thinks this story is a bit cheeky, but it's a true story, and so I am going to tell it. True story. This is to show you that what the Queen has to put up with and why you were right to toast her and should use her as your role model. The Queen, since 1952, has been to the Royal Variety Performance on 57 separate occasions. Eli, your president has not put through this ordeal. Basically, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, who are an elderly couple, go to the theatre each year and see entertainers who do not entertain them. That's the long and the short of it. I, when I was writing this book about the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, had the privilege of sitting in the royal box at the Royal Variety Show with the Queen and Prince Philip. And I have to tell you, sitting next to Prince Philip for the three and a quarter hours of the Royal Variety Show is like I imagine being locked in the commentary box of the Eurovision Song Contest with Graham Norton on speed. <laughs> you get three and a quarter hours of non-stop cynical banter. <coughs> Most of it was Greek to me, but I got the gist. <laughs> and the finale of the Royal Variety Show on that particular year was an excerpt <coughs> we can have some water. Was an excerpt from The Full Monty. And um, I don't know if any of you saw the stage show of The Full Monty, or the movie of The Full Monty. It's a, it's a show about 18 unemployed steelworkers who form a male striptease group like the Chippendales to make ends meet. What's well, rather good to make ends meet. Anyway, uh, these, um, the show ends with these 18 strapping lads coming onto the stage and doing this uh, complete striptease. Everything but everything comes off. And uh, but fortunately, when the last bit of cloth hits the floor, there's a blinding lighting effect facing the audience to spare their blushes. Nevertheless, this male strip tea show is what the organisers of the Royal Variety Performance felt an appropriate entertainment to set before Her Majesty the Queen, now a lady of 88 summers, and His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, who will be 93 in two weeks' time should he be spared. That's what they thought these two old codgers would enjoy, this strip tea show. Anyway, there I am in the royal box, sitting with the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. The Duke of Edinburgh is looking at the programme, and he sees the word finale. His spirit saw. <laughs> Beneath the word finale, he sees the title of this final item, the full Monty, and he turns to the Queen and says, oh, look, Gavage, we've reached the finale, and it's the full Monty. He said, I think we're actually going to enjoy the finale this year. It's the full Monty. The full Monty, says, I imagine it's going to be a tribute to the Field Marshal in the Battle of El Alamein. <laughs> well, I have to tell you that His Royal Highness and Her Majesty were quickly, sorely and rudely disabused as onto the stage strode these 18 strapping lads wearing nothing but a couple of golden tassels and a gold lame codpiece apiece. They marched onto the stage, they marched down the stage, they did this hideous dance to ghastly music culminating in the full strip-off. Ping, ping, pong! They were stark naked. Fortunately, on cue, there was indeed the blinding lighting effect so that you could not see a thing if you were seated in the stalls. <laughs> However, if you were seated immediately adjacent to the stage in the royal box, you could see it all. And I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the problem with naked dancing is that not everything stops when the music stops. <laughs> And I also have to tell you, and this is the moment that will make you proud to be British and make those of you who aren't Eli wish that you were. <laughs> I have to tell you that our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, gazed at this hideous, jingling, jangling sight without a hair out of place, without a moistening of the lip, without a furrowing of the brow. She just gazed grimly ahead of her. I sat in the corner of the royal box, ashen-faced, aghast, and trembling. The Duke of Edinburgh leaned towards me and said, you needn't worry, she's been to Papua New Guinea, she's seen it all before. <laughs> So you have proposed a toast to the Queen and I want to propose a toast to you. I have to tell you, I had no idea what this organisation was about till I got here today uh, and I didn't realise it was as sexy as it is. Um, I, I, or nor, if I may say so, as important as it is. 
Uh, I want to be serious for a moment uh, and say something that maybe people don't often say to you. I realize that I've spent my whole life on the whole, living in nice environments, working in good offices, going to schools where I felt comfortable, living in a home that um, actually works, uh, working you know, in different big buildings that function. And actually, I take that for granted. I take it for granted that in Britain things work. And though I was making my joke, this is a lovely room to be in. But the ventilation in this building is important. And actually, ventilation is key, because if we were to have a conference here this afternoon, good ventilation is necessary to make sure that people stay awake. The quality of ventilation actually makes a difference. The quality of heating makes a difference to people's lives. But I'm afraid most people, like me, take everything that you do every day of your lives for granted. And this is the first time in my life I've stopped to think about what you do and on behalf of the millions of others who don't actually ever think about you, thank you very much indeed for making my living environment as good as it has been throughout my life. I think you're brilliant. So I, on my own, would like to salute you on behalf of the millions. So well done you. Seriously, well done you. And well done you belonging to this bizarre organization. <laughs> I, I mean, when I arrived, the B and ES, I thought, oh, it's got four subgroups. Oh, no, 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 it's, it's, it's like the Freemasons here, little sects. And I thought, here is this strange secret society meeting in an upstairs room at Trinity House. What is going on here? And I came in, and there are all these people in this cutthroat business. You're all rivals. And there are people here from huge organizations, Balfour Beatty, down to one-man operations, sitting down as actually as colleagues, and believe it or not, as friends. How you can do this, I don't know. It's a cutthroat business, and yet you come together. I don't know how you can afford to come together. As I understand it, nobody has paid you in about eight years. <laughs> Indeed, I did some research this morning and found that most of you are only actually ever paid, if you're paid at all, after 84 days. I don't know how you live. I don't know how you pay the wages at the end of the week. The whole of your lives must be a nightmare. You probably are on drugs. Um, <laughs> I am, that's why I'm enjoying the occasion so much. <laughs> but class A, I am a conservative. Anyway, really what I want to do is seriously say to you, I think this is an amazing organization. Uh, I didn't understand what you were about. I do have a clearer idea what you're about now. I can see how actually you are fundamental to the good running of the country. And I had no idea about that this morning, and that's quite remarkable. And I was wondering why, when I got here and the drinks, everyone seemed happy. And I think it's because you know what you're doing is worthwhile. And that does make people feel good. You go to bed at night thinking, well, actually, good day's work, a bit difficult. Go on, the margins are a nightmare. But maybe this year, <laughs> yeah, absolute nightmare. Uh, maybe this year we might actually start making money again. But, but actually what we do is worthwhile. And I come from a world of journalism and politics, where all I've ever done is make a noise. And all you've ever done is make a difference, and a tangible difference. And you actually have spent the morning worrying about standards to make what you do even better. It's a bizarre trade association that keeps on challenging itself more and more, and seems to relish it more and more. And so, from someone who knew nothing, I'm going to go away as someone who admires a great deal. And I'm going to propose a toast, if I may, because this seems to me to be a gathering of friends. In a moment, I'm going to hand out these lovely awards here to these splendid people, new young people coming into it, which is exciting, well done. And one of them, a girl, which is worth pointing out because this is not, I didn't expect, <laughs> the inner Jeremy Clarkson didn't expect to see any women in the room today. And there are lots of them, and I, your last president, uh, the benchmark president, if I may say so, showing you Bruce how it should be done, was indeed a woman. Um, <laughs> So this has been a day of unexpected pleasures for me, to find this gathering of people. Many of you I see you've turned up in rented suits. Uh, one or two I notice with rented partners as well. <laughs> Don't worry, I've got a little Latvian friend waiting for me at the uh, Novotel across the way. Um, when in London, why not? Uh, that's the joy of no longer being an MP, it really doesn't matter. Anyway. The point is, I would like to propose a toast to you. I think it's an amazing organization, this, and really worthwhile. And though it's nice to win these trophies, and congratulations, and I hope you find your careers in this field satisfying and rewarding. Um, actually, the most rewarding thing, I think, is the 
the camaraderie that I found around me. So, a short poem, and I texted Bruce to say, could I do this? I'm quite a keen texter, as uh, his uh, lovely wife Wilma already knows. And <laughs> I just hope I get this poem right. Diction can be quite difficult in a room where the ventilation's a bit challenging. Uh, first job I had as a young actor, I, I used to be an actor, played Hamlet once very badly. They threw eggs at me, went on as Hamlet, came off as omelette. Uh, <laughs> But the first job I had as a young actor was on a radio drama. I just had one line in this radio drama as a young detective. Came 40 years ago, came up to the mic, live drama in those days, Saturday afternoon theater, came up to the microphone, one line in this drama, live radio, this was my one line. That was the chair Schmidt sat in when he was shot. <laughs> I, I, I just said it too quickly, didn't come out quite right. So I hope this poem comes out right. Because this for me <laughs> sums up the special nature of this occasion. And as I say, I texted Bruce to say, can I end on a serious note with a short poem? He texted back simply to say, no, you can't. I assume the spell check is faulty on his own mobile. <laughs> so I'm going to recite the poem all the same. Four lines by Hilaire Belloc that for me sum up the special nature of this unusual lunch. From quiet homes and first beginning out to the undiscovered ends, there's nothing worth the wear of winning but laughter and the love of friends. Thank you for your laughter and well done on the friendship that I think is the secret of your success. Thank you. <laughs>